Wonderful. Well, we're so glad to have you this evening for our really, really special keynote. Um, Shalom Thomas L. And let me go ahead and show you. Um, oh, I don't have the right slide here. <laughs> here we go. And let me tell you a little bit about Salome Thomas L., otherwise known as Principal L. He was an award-winning teacher and principal in the Philadelphia School District for over 20 years and is currently the head of school at Thomas Edison Charter in Wilmington, Delaware. He is also an educational and media consultant. He visits schools around the country to consult with principals and teachers to motivate, motivate students to be successful. He's received national acclaim as a teacher and chess coach at Voss Middle School, where his inner city students went on to win a national chess competition. In fact, they won eight championships, and this was, I believe, the first, the only time people, anyone has ever done this in U.S. history. So he has made history. Um, and, and this is actually a really incredible story. Um, he shares it in his book. He's a regular contributor of the Dr. Oz Show and the author of the best-selling book, I Choose to Stay. Um, he frequently appears on C-SPAN, CNN, and NPR, and has received the Marcus Foster Award as the Outstanding School District Administrator in Philadelphia. He received the University of Pennsylvania's Distinguished Martin Luther King Award and was honored as Philadelphia's Magazine's Best Philadelphian and was a regular, uh, was a Reader Digest Magazine Inspiring American Icon. Um, and let me go ahead and show you that slide. And this is his newest book that I have had the pleasure of reading that has a forward by Will Smith. <laughs> Um, and this is called The Immortality of Influence, which is what he will speak about today. So I'm going to go ahead and hand him the mic, and he will get to tell you his inspiring story. And uh, listen and be inspired. <laughs> you can have the mic. Thank you, Shelley. Um, very right to give me a smiley face and let me know that you can hear me. Some of you may not want to hear me, so you can send me a frown if you want. Okay, good. Looks like we have, um, looks like I have good audio. Um, I want to thank you, Shelley. Um, again, uh, I want to reiterate what I said um, earlier is that um, there is no celebrity, there is no more important person in this fight for children and teachers um, than you and, and those uh, of your colleagues who have worked so hard um, to put this great online conference um, together. I mean, to bring people from not only different cities and different states in the U.S., but from different nations across the, um, the world. Um, I think this is what it's going to take, a united effort for everyone to come together and truly believe that our children can be successful as long as the adults in their lives do not give up on them. Um, we have to be united. And, you know, just a small change will send us in the wrong direction, um, and we can't be distracted. You know, and I, I talk to my teachers and students often, that are in the word united, if we change the T and the I, it becomes the word untied. A small change changes the entire definition, the mission, the vision of one word, an entire organization, school, school district, you know, or country. So people like you, Shelley, and, um, and um, Clive, and all of the folks who are involved with putting this conference together are people who understand that the vision is important, but you must have a plan. And, um, and your plan was to bring together educators, parents, people who want to make a difference. And, um, and I, I, can, I can truly say that I am a believer. Um, and my students know that my, my, my motto is a vision without a plan is a hallucination. And, um, and to see what you have dreamed about, what you've worked hard for, to grow into what has become. And this is not your first conference, but I'm sure your plans were for this to be your largest yet. And, um, and I'm just honored to be touched by the people who are here in the audience, but also to be, to be able to, to influence them, hopefully in a powerful, positive way, where they can go back into their own communities. Because we, mu we must all understand that we're here at this conference worldwide 
so that we can educate ourselves, so we can learn about best practices, we can talk and speak to one another, and then go back into our own communities, go back to our own families, go back to our schools, and help someone else. But that has to be the goal of every person who is on this conference. We must go back home, and we must make a difference, and it must happen immediately. So there's your call to action. There's your sense of urgency. It must happen now, and you must be the catalyst for change. And, um, and so I'm honored to, to, uh, to be here. I want to talk to you over the next 20, 30, 40 minutes. If I start feeling like a reverend or a pastor, I might speak for two hours, and Shelly may just have to shut my mic off. But um, I, um, I'm going to talk to you about what do we do with the 7 million minutes that we have young people in our care, in, in, our, in, in our presence, from pre-K to graduation from high school. So that seems like so much time, but as children grow as quickly as they do, that we have learned that we cannot waste any time. You know, and I often say to people that I would rather waste money than waste time because we cannot get time back. And if you don't believe me, ask Tiger Woods, because he'd love to be able to purchase back Thanksgiving Day last year because that was a rough time for him and it has impacted his life tremendously. So time is so important. And so when we work with our young people, we must realize that we can't waste a day and we cannot take anything, you know, for granted. And um, I've spent my entire life trying to make a difference. And I talk in my immortality book that, you know, Shelley has read um, immediately in the first chapter, I talk about how I really felt that my life was a failure. You know, I had a young man who reached out to me and asked for help, who had graduated from my school and gone on to high school, and his friends were coming and saying that he needs help and he needs help. And I waited for that young man to come back to me. It's the story of Willow Briggs, and his nickname was Fu. He's one of our top chess players. And I waited until one student came to me and said, you can't help Willow or Fu anymore because he's been murdered at 16. And I felt like I failed that young man. And I spent my entire life making sure that there would never be another student like that, um, you know, in my life. And, and so, you know, I just hope that I can impress you enough, impress upon you to go out and make a difference in the lives of these young people who need you and me so much. Um, to invite me, um, when, when most people are, are inviting celebrities to come and speak, uh, it humbles me tremendously. And, um, and I, I really uh, want to um, thank the entire organization, all, all of you out there who are participating, because you are the people who help to make this ship move. You know, there, there's no room for any passengers, only crew. We want people who are willing to work hard to make sure that we achieve, you know, all of our missions, and that is to, to believe and, and, and impress upon our young people that they can be successful as long as they listen to their teachers, their mentors, their parents, and they work hard, and, and, and they study. And so, you know, my belief has been for years that we have to teach young people that they must believe in themselves, that they must take responsibility for their own learning and for their own behavior, that they must develop this sense of self-efficacy. But the way they develop that is that we as educators collectively, through what we call collective efficacy, we work with our young people and believe in them, even if it takes us 30 years. To help these students become successful, we never give up on any of them. And so self-efficacy is not about teaching students to be successful. It is about teaching students how to respond when they are not. We students have to understand that failure will be a part of their lives, that they must embrace failure, that they must own failure, they must learn from failure. But they, they, they learn from it, and then they move on, and they become stronger because of it. And if they can look up, they can get up. And we, we have to teach students that you are not a person who, who believes that once something doesn't work out for me, that my life is over, that I must do something drastic. That's what happens to young people um, who don't understand that they can be successful, that those setbacks are only temporary. See, these two, they need to grow up to become people who decide, uh, you know, my life is not right, so I'll, then I'll go and shoot up a college campus or I'm a 20-something-year-old I'm a mom and I'll murder my daughter because I want to party. We don't do that. We don't teach students to do that. We teach students that they can become successful when they work hard. And that's what we have to do. My, and, and, and then the idea is how do we reach those students? 
We reach those students through great teachers, teachers who are supported by principals, who are supported by school leaders, by administrators, who believe that their work, because my work as a principal is reflected in the work of the teacher. If the teacher is not successful, then I am not successful. And as a teacher, all good teachers believe that if their students are not successful, then we are not successful. And so our relationships must be built upon the fact that we work together in the classroom. You've heard um, often during this conference that we must allow students to be as creative as possible. We must allow parents to be involved in this process. But we must be willing to give up ownership, give up some of that control so our students can grow. With flexibility comes longevity, and we must be willing to help those students grow and become the people that they want to be. But we will also support those parents. There's so many parents who struggle. I have parents who come in and they're not happy with the way that I discipline their children, and they come in and say to me, you know, Principal, well, I don't like your program. And then I have to nicely say to them, if your program was working, I wouldn't have to use mine. I have students who are in my school seven, eight years who never come into my office, and I have some children who are in my office more than my furniture. So I truly understand that parents play an important role in raising children and educating children. I remember my mother saying to me long ago that when I first talked to her about wanting to become a teacher, she said to me that you must understand that every teacher is not a parent but every parent is a teacher. And I never forgot that because throughout my career, the students who have been successful, even the ones who struggled but allowed the educators in their lives to help them, are students who had the support of their parents or some other adult you know, in, in their lives. And so I, I do not minimize the role of the parent, myself as a father who struggles to raise these two girls. You know, and I took women's studies twice in college and I still only get one hour of ESPN in my house every night. Now, I don't know how that happens, but for some reason, the girls run my household. And so I am um, looking for some advice on how to gain control as a man when he has two daughters who are just high maintenance because you ladies are high maintenance at any age. It doesn't matter. So I am, as a father, as a parent, God is still working with me. And, um, and I'm going to continue to try my best to do what I can to raise those two young ladies so they grow up to be um, as strong as possible, as confident, to love mathematics, to love reading, to love school, but more importantly, to love themselves and understand that when they see others, they see themselves. I teach my children, and even in school, they must, they must respect diversity. Our students must be able to see one another and not see color, not see religion. They must see another human being, another individual who's going to grow up and make a difference in the world just like them. And so you treat that person as if they are your sister and brother. But my own mother, who, who for me was a great role model as a parent, who was very strong as a single mom, you know, who supported me throughout my entire life as a student, as a teacher, um, uh, is someone who, who I, I often look up to. My mother's in heaven now but I know that she uh, looks down on the work that I'm doing. And my mother spent many of her own years of her life working in schools and working with children. And, um, and, and that was a big inspiration, you know, for me. And my mother, as a third grade student, my mother walked into my classroom and said to my, my teacher, who was a young white female, who was not from our community. I grew up in the, in the uh, poor housing projects in Philadelphia, um, public housing, and, and, and even as a, as a teenager, teenager grew up in public housing. But in third grade, my mother had the presence of mind to go to my teacher and say, listen, I need help. My, this is my next to the youngest child. My mother raised six boys as a single parent. You know, and, and, and she said, I, none of my children are going to college and graduating. One of my children must graduate. And my teacher had every reason to say, well, I can't focus on your son. I have 20, 25, 30 other students. But she didn't do that. That's not what good teachers do. See, excellent teachers move ordinary children to do extraordinary things. And my, my teacher, you know, Ms. Pettit, I'll never forget her. Um, she, she worked very hard with me. And, 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 and when I moved on to fourth grade, she worked with my fourth grade teacher to help me to get into uh, a, one of our top magnet middle schools, you know, in Philadelphia, one of the top schools in the state of Pennsylvania with the Masterman School, School for Gifted Students. And, um, and my fourth grade teacher, Ms. Porter, had been in our school about 30, 40 years. We thought she came with the building. 
Um, and she had about 10 or 15 after-school programs. None of them had a title. Every program was called Get In Here. And we got right in because we knew that those ladies cared about us. And they wanted us there after school because they could keep us safe. And they supported me. They knew I would struggle in a, a school for gifted students because I came from a struggling family. But they supported me. And I went on to high school and became a high school basketball player and thought I could skip college and go right to the NBA. And those teachers came to me and they said, son, you know, we've seen you play basketball. And I thought that maybe they could help me find an agent. They said, no, we can't help you find an agent because you can't jump over a credit card. So you won't be going to the NBA. But they said, you're smart enough to get an MBA. See, these are teachers who are willing to confront me and say to me at an early age as a high school student that you must get educated, that that will be one of your salvations, and you come back and you help other people. And I went on to college um, and graduated. I didn't have a job, which is the story of so many young people who go to college and we're so fearful of coming home and facing our friends who didn't go to college because many of them told us when we left, oh, you'd be better off going to the state pen instead of Penn State. They're waiting to kill your dreams. There's so many young people that we work with today worldwide who face this fear of alienation because there's so many young people who are waiting to tell them that they're failures because at some point in life that maybe they just didn't achieve one of their dreams. But these are children who want to be successful, who work hard, and as adults, we have to support them. And I came home and I called those teachers and I said to them, you know, I graduated from college. I don't have a job. I don't have a car. I don't have an apartment. And my teacher said, well, I didn't promise you that you would have a, a, a job or you'd get rich. I said, yes, but my friends are telling me that I'm a failure because I went away to college and I came home with no job. And those teachers worked hard to help me find a job. I was an undergraduate communications major. And they helped me find a job. And you know, I was actually working for a um, sports channel. And, and um, so I had my dream job, and, but my friends wouldn't be impressed because I wasn't working for ESPN. I wasn't working uh, for the Today Show. So when I got back to the neighborhood, I told the guys that I was working on Nightline. Most of them wouldn't know anything about Ted Koppel because it, takes, it took them two hours to watch 60 minutes. So they didn't know anything about nightly news. But for me, it was important to impress them. Some people who had never graduated from high school, but because I grew up in a community where the pool is so strong, that if, if, if you somehow do not achieve your dreams, that you're viewed as a failure. But those teachers refuse to allow that to happen. And for so many of our young people, that pool comes right within the family. Those students aren't supported by their own families many times. And so we as educators, we as mentors, we become the family for those young people. But those teachers continue to support me and invited me to come in and speak to their students um, at a career day um, activity, and, and I knew that they had an ulterior motive because all teachers have ulterior motives. And I came in to talk to some students about my job in television, and, and most didn't even ask me my name. They wanted to know how much money did Michael Jordan have and, and how many cars did Larry Bird own, but there were a few who came to me after the program, and they said, if you can come in and motivate us, how come you aren't a teacher? And it was the first time in my life that someone had asked me a question. I had no response some young people. See, we can learn from young people. Those young people taught me that I had missed my calling. And I, I enrolled in graduate school, and I got a master's degree, and I got a certificate to teach. I went right back to the same high school and started teaching. And those students were a little older, and they came up to me, and then I thought they would hug me and say, welcome back, Mr. L. But they said, you know, Mr. L, we, you were a fool to leave the TV job. We were hoping you would help us get a job when we finished school. But I knew right away that I have found my home. You know, there are so many people who think that they can walk into teaching or they think because they've made a lot of money that they can somehow become a consultant and, and, uh, and give us advice. Or because they run for political office, they can tell you how to teach a child or run a school. But until you stood in front of a student and said to that child that they can be successful when almost every person in their life has told them that they cannot and have that student look at you and you know they believe you, there's nothing like being a teacher. But I also realized working in a high school, the high school reform does not begin in the ninth grade. It begins in elementary and middle school and even earlier. And so I decided to spend the next 10 years of my life in middle school. I, I moved on to the theater middle school in, in North Philadelphia, which is a very tough area. And I decided that I was going to help these students. And in 10 years at Vaux Middle School, we lost almost 20 students to murder. 
And there is no teacher certification program that will ever prepare you to walk into a classroom and see an empty chair that 11, 12-year-old child will ever, ever sit in again. There's nothing like it. And you know, it takes a lot to be a middle school teacher. You know, uh, 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 middle school teachers, you either love it or you hate it. So all middle school teachers out there, President Obama, if you're listening, all middle school teachers deserve a big raise right now. Right after that, you must give all high school teachers a big raise because they work so hard and they're working with teenagers who think they're adults. And you elementary teachers, you deserve an even bigger raise because you're working with kindergarten children and first grade students and second grade students, many of them who are already caring for themselves. And people who work outside of education may think that that is foreign, but it's not. There's students in elementary and middle school who are not only caring for themselves, but they're caring for younger siblings. Some of them are caring for elderly and sick parents. They have many responsibilities. And so as teachers, as educators, we must be there to support them throughout their trials and tribulations. For my time in middle school, I also realized that that adolescent period is a tough time. It's a tough time for children and for the adults who are working with those children. We have so many students who are making bad decisions, good kids making bad decisions. And I had to find a way to teach my students that they could choose the behavior, but they could not choose the consequences. And that's why I started to teach kids to play chess. You know, I didn't think that any of them would become chess masters or chess champions. I just wanted them to learn mathematics on a chessboard. And I started teaching special education students mathematics on a chessboard. Knights move on right angles. Bishops move on diagonals. The chessboard is a large square that contains 64 smaller squares. But what I did not realize is I was also giving these students intellectual capital. Because these were, these were special education students who were now walking around a school carrying chess boards. So people would come up to them, other students, and say, you know, aren't you uh, in that LD program? And the student would say, yes, I sure am. Why don't we play a little chess and see if you should be my roommate? You know, if you don't think anything else about a student who carries a chess board, is you believe that that student is intelligent. So then everybody wanted to play chess. And so all these students wanted to play. They were beating me. I, they started beating other teachers. And we started taking them out to, to play against other schools. And these were elementary and middle school kids. They started beating our high schools. So we decided that we needed to take them to tournaments. And, and lo and behold, these students went on to become national champions. And at Boss Middle School, there is an historic legacy. At this school, in the toughest neighborhood in the city, where the cost of living is going up and the chance of living is going down. The murder rate in Philadelphia is very high. But these were young people who dodged bullets, who ran away from drug dealers, who did everything they could to be successful and play chess. And these students won seven consecutive national titles at this school, never done before in America by any public, private, parochial, charter. It doesn't matter. These students were the best at what they did. And um, we would often have people who would come to us and say, you know, who are the chess masters that work with these students? And I have to say to them, we, we're a poor school. We can't hire a chess master. These are children who believe that they can be successful, and they're surrounded by teachers who teach them that success only comes before work in the dictionary, that they must work hard and continue to work hard if they're going to be successful. And that was so, my, my idea was that if I could take this concept and take it from one classroom and make it something school-wide, where everybody in school wanted to be a chess player instead of a basketball player, instead of a football player, then I could, I would, I would be on to something. See, because chess teaches students to critically think. It teaches them the problem solve. I mean, it, it teaches them logic, reasoning, to, to think three, four moves ahead which is not only as important as a child, but as an adult. Many of these children who grew up and became uh, successful adults said that how they drew on their skills they learned as a chess player as a child when they were in college and when they became business professionals. But I said to myself, working in this middle school for 10 years, that I have to have a larger impact, that I need to make this school-wide, I need to make it district-wide, I need to make it nationwide, worldwide. So I decided that I wanted to become a principal. But I had to call my boss first, and that was my mother. And I said, Mom, I'd like to be a principal. And she said, Boy, have you lost your mind. 
Why in the world would you want to want to work with adults? And I said, Mom, but I'm tired of breaking the fights in the lunchroom and in my classroom between kids. And she said, Son, don't you know that as a principal, you will break up more fights between your teachers than you ever have between your students? And she told the truth. But you know what? I have not regretted my, my decision to become a principal one minute. It is the greatest job in the world because I knew from the first day that I could only be successful if I respected and protected my teachers, that I, had, I realized that I could do nothing without those teachers. So when one comes into my building coughing and sneezing, I'm in her room right away with a cup of hot tea and lemon. And she says, oh, Principal L, you must love me. And I say, yes, I love you, but you also have Rashida and you have Brian in your room who have given me trouble for years. But this year I have not heard one word from them. And so I cannot come in and control your classroom the way you do, so I must keep you healthy. See, as principals, as leaders, we must understand that it is our duty. It is the duty of the administration to serve the people, not the people to serve the administration. So my mother said to me, son, I will give you my blessing. You can become a principal, but you must remember one thing, that when you walk into your school for the first time, that you will meet teachers who have been there for chief principal after principal after principal. You will have old ladies who have been at your school teaching the children of the children that they have taught. They will be smarter than you. They will be more experienced than you. And she said you must bow down, you must respect them, and you must submit to them and understand that they, that they are successful because principals support them. And I said, Mom, I got it. And I went to school, and in my first faculty meeting, I used my mother's entire script. The problem for me was I didn't edit out the part about the old ladies. And so I was in big trouble. For my first year, I had to buy color copiers and whiteboards and everything for every. If they had smart boards in 1999, I would have purchased one for everybody because I needed to get back in the good graces of those ladies. But more importantly, folks, and seriously, I understood early on that if I was going to be successful, that I had to be willing to support those teachers but I also could not be afraid of the conflict. So this goes out to all of you, all of you aspiring principals and administrators who are out there right now listening, that you understand that you, you support those teachers. You support your children, your families, but you must also have the courage to make the tough decisions for your children. I made those mistakes early in life. I, I made some decisions where my teachers benefited and my students did not. And I had to understand that my role as a leader was I had to embrace conflict. You know, I had my pastor say to me one day that the price of leadership is conflict. And we have to be willing to say to a teacher, no, you're a great, you know what, you're a great third grade teacher, but you're not a great sixth grade teacher. And so I'm going to have to keep you in third grade. Or, hey, maybe for some people you may have to say, listen, maybe you should try something else, but this is just, just not working. Or maybe say to a teacher, let me support you in becoming a better teacher but making those tough decisions that we know that may not make us popular. Because early on, I wanted to be the popular principal. But when I became successful, it was because I was no longer concerned about being popular. I was concerned about doing what was best for my students. And, and, here, and here's the kicker, folks. It never involved raising the test scores of my students. Because I truly believe that there's so many ways that you can manipulate test data. And you can read about the controversies going on in, in some of the major cities right now. There are people who are able to manipulate that. My belief is that if students are cared for, if they are supported, if they have teachers who believe in them and principals who support them and families who are there for them, and if they're struggling, then schools and communities who support them, then those students will become successful. And it may not happen when you're ready for it to happen, but when it does happen, we have to be there to celebrate with those children. And that has been my belief, and that is what I believe Chess has taught students that there can be short-term gain and long-term gain. But I have never, ever eliminated the arts, never eliminated music from my school. As a matter of fact, my graduation, when I, my first elementary school, when I converted it from a K-5 to a K-8, our graduation was at the Philadelphia Art Museum because I wanted everybody in the city to understand that we supported the arts. And we cannot forget that because the art and music is the engagement before information. 
So we cannot, and, and because we want our students to be successful on standardized tests, begin to eliminate all of those other subjects that make our students who they are. We can't do that. We have to believe that the test is just a, a short term. It's, 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 it's a, a small stop in the life of a child. I'm sure we need that data. We need the data to be able to see how we can help our students. But we don't label schools as F schools or D schools. We don't label schools as failing. Or we don't say to people, you're not a good teacher, because I gave you students who have all struggled, who have all had attendance issues, and then you somehow don't have 90% for proficiency rate in your classroom. But yet you've taken students who have been at 20 and 30% their entire life, and you have them at 50 and 60 and 70%. You've worked so hard, but yet you're viewed as a failure. Never, ever in my presence will anyone call you a failure when you have worked as hard as you could to help students that almost everyone and even some people from their own families have given up on. Folks, I'm going to tell you, this life as a teacher and this life as a principal has been a rough one for me, but it has been enjoyable because I know that I am better and I am stronger because of what I've gone through, but also because of the people who have helped me since I was a young child. When my first year as principal ended, I had a young man call me who had been one of our first chess players. And he struggled as a young man. Um, his name was Otis Bullock. And he grew up in a family with uh, 10 or 11 people in his household. Kids teased him about, you know, wearing the same clothes all the time, but he was a good kid. We helped to get him into our Magnet High School, uh, one of our top schools, the Carver High School for Engineering and Science. But he struggled there and ended up graduating from a, a comprehensive neighborhood high school. And he went all the way to college, and we hadn't heard from him, so we assumed he dropped out. But I got a call from Otis in June of 2000, and he said, uh, Principal L, I just want to let you know that I'm graduating from college. And I said, you're graduating from college, Otis? And he said, yes, I am. I said, wait a minute, Otis. I didn't even know you were back in college. Where are you in school? He said, Westchester State. I said, Westchester State Prison? He said, no, Westchester State University. And I said, Otis, are you really graduating? I've been to too many funerals. I need to go to more graduation. He said, no, I'm graduating, but I don't want you to come. He said, if my, uh, today is Friday and I'm graduating on Sunday, I only need you to do me one favor, Mr. L. He said, I want you to call all of my former teachers and let them know that one of their kids made it. And I said, Otis, you understand, I need to be there. Otis, I need to be at your graduation. So my wife and I made the drive to Otis's graduation, an hour-long drive, and it was 100 degree heat. Everybody passing out at the graduation, and uh, I cried through the entire ceremony. I just couldn't believe that one of my kids made it. But I also thought about those 20 kids who had been murdered in his same school who would never be able to walk down that aisle like him. And I'm sure that they were smiling down and watching Otis and saying, do it for me, Otis. And, um, and after the graduation, I took pictures of Otis with his friends, with his professors. I took pictures of, of Otis with people he didn't even know. I was just so proud to see that one of our kids had made it. And uh, Otis shared with me that uh, many of his family members didn't come to the graduation. And I said, Otis, bro, you need to look in the audience. Because I made sure that every teacher who ever knew, who ever met or touched that young man was in the audience. And um, it was such a phenomenal day to see those teachers come out and support that young man. That was June of 2000. And in, in, in May of 2004, Otis Bullock graduated from Temple Law School. It was probably the proudest day of my life as a teacher, as a father, as a principal, to see one of your kids become successful. And all of the teachers were there again, as you always are, as we will continue to be there for our children. And um, we were just so proud of Otis. And I said to Otis, you take your diploma, because see, when you get a JD, they give you a large diploma. So you take it back to the neighborhood, Otis, and you show all your friends who teased you when you were young, because you listened to your teacher, teachers and you listen to your principal and your mentors, and you show them what happened. I said, but also let them know that their fathers teased me when I came home from college and didn't have a job. Because, folks, I did probably one of the craziest things in the world is I became a teacher and principal in the same neighborhood where I grew up. And it was very challenging because you are viewed as the enemy when you come into your own community and you try to deliver education to young people. But we were able to save lives. We were able to convert people to believe that they had to understand that they were going, that education was going to be the way to make it, you know, out of um, of the community. And it was, I was so proud of Otis and, and so proud of just the story because see, and that's what that's what encouraged me to write. I choose to stay. Otis's graduation was where I began to formulate this idea of a book 
where we're able to say to students that there are thousands of teachers out there, there are thousands of leaders and principals who are helping young people. Not one. I'm not, I'm not the only person who's making a difference. There are millions of them. But Hollywood loves to tell the story of the one person who came in and saved everybody, and it doesn't happen like that. This story happens through years and years of failure, of crying, of struggle, but of teachers who don't give up on our children. And it's not about waiting for Superman. We've never waited for Superman. And I understand what Jeffrey Canada was talking about. I have a lot of respect for Jeffrey Canada. But I must say that we cannot buy into this concept that charter schools are going to be the answer, that they're going to come in and save everybody. I am a charter school principal, folks, and I'm saying this to you, that charter schools are only a part of the solution, that what we need to do is develop and build good schools for all of our children. There shouldn't be one family in this world who is able to say that I'm not happy with my school and I have nowhere to go. We must give those families options. What gives me the right or you the right? Because our children are able to go to the schools they want to attend, or we can move and make sure they attend better schools. To say to a parent who is stuck in a community where the schools aren't successful and she has nowhere to move or she's homeless, and we say to her, you have no right to put your child in a school because you feel that that school might offer them a better education. No, that's hypocritical. We can't say that. We must give them the opportunity to be able to do that. But what we must do on an even larger level is build schools, develop schools. And as teachers, we just start our own movement. If the government can't get it right, then we just start self-run schools. We just run our own schools because we are tired of people saying to us, this is what must be done in schools, but you never invite us to sit at the table and participate in the discussion. That can't happen anymore, folks. We have to fight for our children, and we have to fight for our schools. I know that every child deserves to have at least one person be crazy about them, and you are that person. You are the one who can make a difference, and it takes people who are willing to go to children who may not look like them. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're black or you're white or you're Latino, Hispanic, Native American, Asian. It doesn't matter. Children will simply want you to look in their eyes and say to them, you can be me because I was once you. That's all they want. And then we collectively, as a group, decide that we are going to help our children, that we are going to do whatever we can, that we will believe in them and never give up on them. That's why I started a chess program. That's why I invited the 100 Book Challenge program to come into my school and teach and give my students the power and love of reading. We have to teach students that reading has to be a habit, not something that you just do when you're punished. It's something that you love to do and you do all the time. You read for a half hour, an hour a day, two hours. You enjoy it. You embrace it, and it becomes what you need to do that makes you successful. You travel through reading. But also, I wanted to build a school where students were going to embrace and accept and appreciate diversity. That's why in 2003, when my students came in school talking about how teachers don't like them if they don't look like them and they don't understand the community, and I said, no, that's not true. You have to learn about people from all walks of life. And I contacted a principal in Vermont and, and asked if I could bring my students to Vermont. And he said, oh, great, it would be a great trip. And I said, when will be a great time for my students to come and really feel the true essence of Vermont? He said, February. Now, folks, I chose Vermont because Vermont is not a very diverse state, but it's, but it's the first state to abolish slavery in the state constitution. Now, the inner city is not very diverse either, so our students needed to be able to make that trip. And I'm going to close on this. But I took 15 students in February of 2003 on Amtrak train to Burlington, Vermont. And it was 20 below zero. The wind chill factor was 40 below. So you know my students were very happy. And there were some parents who sent their students on this trip with just a hoodie, no coat, no jacket. But there were teachers who were smart enough to bring extra jackets and coats for our children. But those children had spent a wonderful time in Vermont learning from white children in Vermont. Those students in Vermont showed them a home where Frederick Douglass stayed. They showed them a home where Harriet Tubman was allowed to hide. I mean, these were students learning their own history from other children. And I think these cultural partnerships, these activities are what our students need. And these were students from the hood, from the projects. But they wouldn't go anywhere near Lake Champlain, which was three feet of frozen ice, three feet thick. But they wouldn't go anywhere near it because it wasn't a part of their culture. Our students need that kind of exposure. There's a large achievement gap, folks.
but there's also a major exposure gap. Three-fourths of the children were grown up in poor communities. The research will show you travel within three miles of their home by the time they're 18 unless they're traveling to school. These students need to get out and they need to be able to go out and learn, and we can become the people who are, are able to give them those opportunities. It is us. It is we. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? God bless you all. KDO's take on Diga. Please continue to work hard for our children. And trust me, I will see you again. And when I do, I will ask you, what have you done for our children lately? Thank you very much. Mike, back to you, Shelly, for questions. Wow. <laughs> I'm in tears like probably most of the audience. <laughs> you should read the chat later. Um, we, we've all pretty much um, voted for you to be the Secretary of Education. <laughs> that is really amazing. I uh, wish it didn't stop. <laughs> I know there's tons of questions. If, if you guys want to um, ask a question to the audio, just press the blue hand with the green arrow and, um, and we'll get your question answered. Um, while we wait for that, Lisa Harris is going to go ahead and read some of the questions that she ran into in the chat box. Thanks, Shelley. We have a couple of good questions for Principal L. Um, the first one I have for you comes from uh, Beverly CJ, and she would like to know how do you get the child who has low self-esteem, learning barriers, or difficult home circumstances to believe that he or she can achieve his or her dreams? Uh, that's a good, great question because that's probably um, the biggest problem facing most educators around the world. And um, what I've found to be successful is that I try to go to where those students are. So if it means that I have to go to the neighborhood playground, if I have to go to the student's basketball game or soccer game, um, if I have to go to the neighborhood laundromat and find a way to connect with that student, I've got to find a way to go to their world and then get them to come into my world. And, um, and it becomes difficult because there's so many children who have people around them who sort of tell them that they can never be successful. And so they say, why should I listen to you? You're just one person against the so many who tell me that I can't be. And then what we do is we expose them to people who come from the same beginnings, from the same background, who become successful. We tell them the stories about the people that we've met right on Twitter, the people we meet right at conferences who are able to share their stories, but also stories of their own students who are successful. And then if we have to, then we make those students a part of our own family. I'm sure that there are people right on, on this, this uh, session right now who will give you examples of how they've taken children from school into their own homes, taking them out to events just so they can support them and give them a family environment. We have to believe that, that we must do anything possible to get those children to understand that they can be successful. But the flip side is that we can't make them overconfident. So if they don't believe in themselves and are not successful, we have to make sure that those students are also working hard. We can't get them to believe that because they're not working hard that they can still be successful. There's a lot of research around students being unsuccessful because they're overconfident. They somehow didn't work hard and were told that they were successful anyway. No, we must support those students, but get them to believe that they must take responsibility and they must work hard, but more importantly, that we will be there for you. Every time you fall, we'll be there to pick you up and continue to walk with you along the way. But find good role models, find mentors for those students, because students in the same family, successful families, where one student is not successful and the other one is, is most times because there was some adult uh, in the community who worked with that one student who was successful. Great. Um, we have another question for you coming up from Power Up Learning, and they would like to know, how has the Leader In program influenced your work with your children and your students? Well, this year we're going to be a Leader Me school for the first time, and we started our um, uh, Seven Habits training you know, in the spring, and I have never seen my staff more excited about professional development than after we had the seven habits training. Um, it, is, it has been unreal. I've spent about a year, um, it was about a year ago where I actually met uh, Stephen Covey, his son Sean, 
and the uh, whole Franklin Covey team and learned about the Leader Me program, which is a program, program for elementary schools um, and elementary and middle schools where um, students and the staff all learn just these leadership principles and how these students, even in kindergarten, have data notebooks, how these students can, can keep track of what they're doing and understand that, that, that you know, they need to create win-win situations and, and, uh, and just become students who want to be successful but realize that they have to have priorities, that they have to set goals for themselves. And um, it is, um, has been transformational for us so far, and, um, and my parents have been excited about it. So I'm going to be reporting back on Twitter. You can follow me um, at principal underscore L or um, at Thomas Edison Charter. Um, we, are, um, we are there. We'll be reporting back to you um, about our year um, in the Leader Me process because our goal is to become the first lighthouse school uh, in Delaware. We'll be the first full Leader Me school in Delaware. But, folks, if you need, please go on to uh, franklincovey.com and, and, and check out the Leader Me program because it's a great program to teach leadership skills for young people, but also for teachers. Um, check it out. It's great. Okay. Um, next up for you, from Heidi, would like to know, what are you optimistic about in terms of what's happening in education? I guess I, I am probably most optimistic about the grassroots efforts that you see happening around the country um, and around the world, um, you know, the SOS march and, and, and so many folks who are, who are now organizing, even the number of educators who are on Twitter. I am amazed at the connections we make, you know, right on Twitter, um, right online and on Google and on Facebook and, um, and all these other places. I think that the electricity that has been generated by the educators who have decided that we need to synergize, that we need to work together. You know, my, 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 my uh, mantra in school is teamwork makes the dream work. And I think that we're beginning to see teachers now work together. We're not going, no longer will we be divided and conquered. No more coming to us and saying, let me underpay you for 20 years, and then if you raise test scores next year, I'll give you merit pay. No, you need to make sure that you are taking care of the most noble servants in this world, people who give their lives to children. And so I'm probably most, most optimistic about the fact that we are now we are now taking our profession back. And I've been waiting for us to please stop admiring the problem. Let's, as a group of educators worldwide, let's unite. And through Twitter and through other avenues, let's come together and have conferences like this. Let's meet and let's become powerful and let's develop the educational system that we know our children deserve. Wow, I was getting choked up on that one too. There's a lot of comments coming through the chat box of people saying how much they're being touched by what you're sharing. Um, the next question that we want to ask out for you comes from Chris, and Chris wants to know, how do you turn around those students who get to high school that they're already okay with failing before you even get started with them? That, that is a, that's a big problem in America. I think it's probably a hidden issue you know, as well, because um, we focus many times, and we should on younger students, but, you know, and I say this often to people, that 50% of students who drop out of high school drop out in the ninth grade or before, but yet we often wait until students are sophomores and juniors before we take them on college visits. We have to take students to visit colleges in elementary and middle school, and at my school at Thomas Edison Charter in Wilmington, we are now not only taking students to colleges in elementary and middle school, we're taking their parents because many parents have never gone to college. They don't understand the process, the financial aid, the application process, the admissions process. And so they're not able to offer their children any counsel, any guidance. And so they're intimidated and they have removed themselves from the process. I think we as educators, we have to have that vision, that we have to understand that we can't wait until high school to help these children. But when they do arrive to you in high school, sir, that we must again, become the family, become the fathers. Most of these young men are growing up in a fatherless society and fatherless homes. And when they look at you, they don't care if you're white, you're black, if you're bald, if you're going to buy hair, you have hair. It does not matter to them. They just know that you are a man who comes here every day and you're here and you say to me, I'm still here. No matter what they say, they come into high school and they say, F you. 
You know, Bill Riley asked me, what would you do if a kid, when they, what do you do when a kid says, F you, Principal L? I said, well, first of all, Bill, kids rarely say that to me. And then when they do, I tell that child, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not happy you feel that way, but I'm going to be here tomorrow. So you're going to have to change your attitude because that's not enough to get rid of me. When children know you're relentless, persistence overcomes resistance. When those children know that you will be here, eventually they'll just give in. They behave like that because they don't know if you're going to be in their lives from day to day, from year to year, because most men have not been there. But when they know that you're going to be there, they'll give in and they will show you who they are and they will subscribe to your program. And then if they don't, you call me, you email me, you find me on Twitter or Facebook anywhere, and I'll come and visit your school and do a Principal L drive-by, and we will save that child's life. I like that, a Principal L drive-by. I have to keep that one in mind. Um, I have two more from uh, the written chat before we go to the uh, audio. And this one comes from Barrelope, and she would like to know, what is your definition of success? Wow, my definition of success. These are harder than SAT questions. You know, you know what I was thinking about um, um, yesterday is often when I call uh, my principal colleagues and I say, you know, how did the year go, how are things going, they almost always begin with whether they made AYP and, and um, whether they, they did well. And, 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 and I tell them, listen, I'm not even asking about test scores. I want to know about the lives that you're saving. I want to know about the teachers that you're bringing back next year. Because, see, I'm a firm believer that the greatest form of recruitment is retention. And the greatest form of retention is recruitment. So we've got to take care of the teachers we have to make sure that we get in good teachers. And then we have to bring good people onto our team to be able to retain the great people we have. So I want to know about those teachers who are growing. I want to know about those students who are doing well. Um, and, and so for me, success, and, and my school made AYP uh, this year, and, and we're in a school, we serve 94 kids, 94% of kids at or below the poverty level. You know, and, but I never ever, I, I never say to people, I'm proud of my school because we made AYP. And see, what I do is I turn around schools. So I will only go to a school if it's failing. And my, and my belief is that any school, no matter what kind of shape it's in, if you have the right leader, you have the right teachers, that that school can become successful. You don't need any special test taking, test prep program. You don't need any special curriculum. You need teachers who are willing to learn, who are willing to work together. You need a supportive board. You need a principal who is willing to get out of the way and let teachers teach. I know my limits, and I know my job. And my mother said to me that, that uh, uh, arrogance is the Achilles heel of the school principal. So my office is always open. I'm always open to ideas, you know, from my teachers. And I think that my idea of success is a school where people are working together, where people have the belief that they can do it. Even if we struggle for years, we struggle together. And that's what's important to me. We're successful when we help students because those students who struggle in those state tests, see, we don't, the government doesn't tell you about their story. Five, ten years from now, these students are going on to college and doing great things that the state label as failing students. Sometimes it just takes adults who will not give up, who will work together, and who are willing to see success in the small victories and willing to wait. Be patient, but be ready, because our children will never, ever let you down if you wait long enough until that light comes on. Right before we end, um, I'm going to end with a question from Will, but we actually got one more in the chat box that I want to throw to you before I give you Will's question because his will be a great one for you to round out with. Um, so from Ryan Redtob, they would like to know, there's a tremendous amount of tension growing or already existing between teachers and administrators. How do we rebuild those bridges when they are broken or breaking? wow, there's tension between teachers and administrators, I wouldn't know it because I thought my teachers loved me because <laughs> I sure love them. I mean, even for professional development, I took my teachers to Rehoboth Beach for a day. Now, of course, I had them there, you know, playing tug of war and, and, and flag football and, and, and trying to find out which team was smarter than the other, just all team building activities, but it was a day for us to grow as a group. See, when you're going to turn a school around, it's about changing the culture of the school. 
the culture of togetherness, of teamwork, that we struggle together and we're successful together. And I think that if we're going to prepare the broken relationships between teachers and administrators, that we both need to understand that we have roles in the building and that ultimately the decision has to be mine. And so you have to respect that power, but I also have to respect you because you are the one person who makes a difference. I've never seen one principal become successful because his teachers were not successful. So, you know, if we, so teachers understand that when you come in, that you work with that principal and you support that principal, the principal does the same. The principal then turns around and says, I will support you. I will not throw you under the bus. I have many superintendents pissed off at me to the highest of festivity because I have protected my teachers when they needed to be protected. And I've gone to boards and say, I know that you said that there's no money available for raises, but we've got to find a way to help teachers. We find money to build stadiums. We find money to do all the other things that are not important, but when it comes to our children, we don't have money. I, I believe that we have to work together. Our children are suffering because of those broken and failed relationships. Children are very observant. They know in a school when teachers don't speak to one another. They know in a school when a principal doesn't respect his staff. I worked in a school as a teacher where we had to face those issues, and it was tough working in that environment. And I said to myself that I would be dedicated to making sure when I became an administrator that I would have respect for my teachers, anything, even when I tell them something that may not be positive or they may not want to hear, I will deliver it in a way where I will say, we will get better. We will make this change. We will do it together. And I think when people are disciplined with dignity, they're willing to accept those consequences and grow from them. But principals must understand, and I say this to my colleagues often because I'm going to go publicly and say it, folks, that all principals don't get it. And I had some teachers had to bring me to this realization that all principals don't get it. And so I'm working with my colleagues to understand that we have to just sit back and listen and learn sometimes from teachers and from other stakeholders that they have been there. They have the experience. Let's sit back and learn. The most intelligent people in the world are good listeners. We teach students that. So I think as adults and as leaders that we will be wise to take that advice as well. Okay, so we're going to round it out from the uh, written questions before I throw it back to Shelley for any left on the audio with the hands up. Um, and you have shown such tremendous passion and such tremendous energy for what you do. This question from Will will really round this out. He would like to know, how do you stay renewed and not get burned out with this work? Will, I'm going to tell you, if I could, you know, I had a lady say, Principal L, you ought to write that book because I talked um, uh, I spoke to a group and talked about that, finding that balance, you know, because we work so hard in our schools. We take our, we take our work home and we bring home the work. Sometimes my daughters are at school with me, um, and she, she said, you know, Principal, I'll write that book and I'll buy it today because that is probably on the minds of so many people worldwide is how do we, how do we keep that energy? How do we keep fighting those battles? when we get beat down by so many other people, but yet we have those struggles right within our own families. And I think it's because I have stayed close to the children. I have refused to take the superintendent job. I have refused the invitations to run for office. I have refused the invitations to come to D.C. Even you folks here are the same, Secretary of Education. They don't want to deal with me in D.C. Only my teachers will put up with my nonsense. And so I have found happiness and what I do. I have not called Walt Disney one time to say, you know, we've got a script for this movie and everything. You know, Disney purchased the movie option rights to my, my first book. I have not called them one time and said, when are we making this movie? I'm not concerned because you know why when they decide to make it or whoever makes it, I know that they're going to pull me away from my school, and I am not ready to do that. I love my job. My, I, I go to work and do what I do, and then I get paid. And I think that that is how I remain energized is because I know that I'm happy doing what I do. I'm happy there with those children. Those teachers are, are, are there every day. For me to see people who are underpaid, who are overworked, give so much of their own lives, they sacrifice their own families to make sure that they can plant a tree whose shade they may never enjoy. 
that to me is the ultimate warrior. And I want to be able to work and be a soldier next to that person as long as I am alive. But I also know that I am no good to anybody if I'm not healthy. So you'll see right on Twitter, I let people know every day when I'm running. You know, I, I ran two miles a day to get ready for my session. I've run five days in a row, um, 10 out of the last 12 days. I have to be healthy. The principal should be in the best shape in the building. He should be, he or she should be the best, the best dressed in the building, the most professional. You are the leader. The principal is a role model in the building and in the community because the school belongs to the community. And so I am energized. I am always ready because I try to eat right. I try to take care of myself, but I also make sure that I'm there for my family. When I come home bloody and they patch me up like a fighter who's been in the ring for three minutes and is beat up, and they, and they patch me up and send me back out there for another round of, of, of getting beat up by everybody, and I come back home, they're always there to embrace me. And so family, you want to keep family close but you also want to make sure that you're respecting those people you work with and appreciating those teachers because without teachers, without teachers, our children will continue to struggle. And so we must make sure that we take care of that. Okay, that's all we have for the questions from the chat. Shelly, it's back over to you for the wrap-up. Well, I'd like to give a round of applause real quick for Lisa for getting all those questions. Uh, that is just amazing that you were able to collect all those questions. What, I'm sure people would like to make a comment at, or say something on the mic. Um, e even, you know, uh, just say, e not necessarily a question, but if you want to share something with Principal L, you're more than welcome to. This is your chance. So just uh, click the blue hand with the green arrow, and uh, we'll go ahead and give you the microphone. <laughs> so, Debbie, you have the microphone. Okay, well, let's have uh, Vicki Lawrence then, and you have the microphone. And Vicki is from Switzerland. I know that. <laughs> Principal L, you're such an inspiration for all of us, and that's an understatement. Thanks so much for everything. Vicki, Vicki, I, I finally get a, I finally get a chance to hear your voice. I've, I've met you so much and talked to you on Twitter. I am so proud of your work and all that you represent, and I appreciate you coming to the session and, um, and just want you to continue to do what you do because it's people like me who continue in this fight because of people like you, and I appreciate uh, all of your support and all of your hard work. Power up learning. Hi, Principal L. I just wanted to say thank you. Your presentation was amazing. Um, I'm a young administrator in New Orleans, and it's a very challenging city to work in, um, particularly around getting our students to excellence. And I'm a member of a cohort of principals who are doing this work in terms of transforming schools. I can't wait to share this video, this audio feed with them. It was just so inspirational and inspiring. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. Oh no problem. And yes, you are in a uh, you are in a very very tough situation. But those children are only going to be able to make it out successful because of people like you. You got Paul Valestown who came from Philly, and I know he's working with you know the, the schools there. But this job, this work is done by teachers, principals, and other people who work in schools. Also, folks, we can't forget about those those uh, uh, folks in the cafeteria, those secretaries who do so much in schools, um, those classroom assistants. All of those supportive personnel who really help us do our jobs. Um, it, it is amazing the work that they do, but I'm so glad that there are young people like you who still are coming into our profession and want to make a difference. We've got to find a way to be able to build a, a foundation of young leaders, teachers, administrators who want to come in and, and continue this work. And so please let me know how I can support you um, in New Orleans. 
that don't have to be a fly by to New Orleans. It can't be a drive by. But um, I am. Um, I often go and visit. You know, people write me and say, "Come and visit my school and talk to my students and talk to my principal or talk to my parents and just talk to a dead body, anybody." But uh, you know, just come and help. And if, if I'm available, I, I will be more than willing to try and and help you because in my school, I just try to make two words important: rigor and joy. I want students happy and I want them working hard. And we're we're in a poor school where students are struggling. But we implemented a pre-AP curriculum from the college board and middle school. Oh, these students were on fire when they saw this, and the teachers, because it required 30 hours of training. But one year later, the teachers are happy, the students are happy, because they're embracing the rigor and they're finding happiness and knowing that they can be some, become successful when they're supportive or with people like you. Jessica, you have the mic. Hi, I, are you able to hear me? Okay, hopefully you can. Okay, um, I'm I'm down in Santiago, Chile, and I just wanted to thank you so very much. Um, I'm been a curriculum pseudo admin for the last three years, and I've sort of lost my passion recently, along with my staff. And I think that when I play back this message, uh, your discussion today with my staff, you're going to re-energize me, my staff, and everyone, and put us back on track. We were going well and we lost our way, but hopefully with you there at the helm of our new message, we'll get back on track. So I just want to say thank you very much for that. It was really, truly inspirational. Wow, you just made my day. Um, I, am, uh, I am so honored that, that, that you would, uh, number one, even come and join us, but to go back and share with your staff what we've talked about today, I think, is the very reason why Shelly and her team put the conference together. And, um, and I, I, I hope that you and your crew can go back and just realize that there will be struggles, that there will be years that will be tough, but you are saving lives. You're preventing funerals. That's what I say to teachers and educators that. That's what we do. We're keeping children alive. And um, I've never been to South America, and um, I'm planning a trip. I've had some folks... Um, who I've met through on several other programs, um, talk about inviting me to South America. So if I ever get there, I would love to visit um, Chile and come and visit your school and fire your staff up in person. So you can say, I not only have the video, but I have the man. And his head is a little more bald than he is on, on the screen, but, um, but he still wants to work hard and, uh, and, and help us to do the same. So thank you so much for all you do. Have Will, people got you. Uh, hello, uh, how are you doing? Um, my, my question um, mostly goes to how, how important is it for you, I, I guess, as a black man to do uh, what you do? Uh, because uh, when I used to work with young people, you know, I brought with me the, the weight of our community and, uh, you know, I'm 37, but my parents uh, drank from colored on the water fountains and, and sat in the back of the bus. And with me, when I went with young people, it, it, I just wanted to impress upon them the importance of getting an education and what it, it, it means, uh, you know, to our community and, and to our future. And the, the, the weight just got to me to the point of dealing with them in the community and what I just had to step back and be like, okay, I have to do something else because uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. So how do you see yourself, I guess, as a black man in what you do? Uh, thanks for your question. I, I see myself as a role model for all people. As you know, the, the image of the black man worldwide is not always positive. And, um, and to be quite honest with you, there have been many, not only black men, but just men in general, who have not done anything to help the reputation of men. Um, women have carried this world, have carried, especially in the United States, for over 200 years they've carried our community. And it's time for men to step up. It is time for us to join this fight. It's time for us to become better fathers, to make sure that we are getting involved in education. And so I feel like I am, I'm just one man who's trying to make a difference. They, I believe in the power of one. And if I can just influence or inspire one other person 
one other man, one child to do the same thing, then I've done my job. And, um, and so I see myself as, as an example of a young man who struggled growing up in a struggling family, but who people helped. People who did not look like me, who were not from my community, but who said that, son, you can be successful, and when you make it, you must come back and make a difference. And, um, and so I see myself now as the man who has to reach back and grab another one. Each one must teach one. And so I'm giving back and trying to do the same thing. And it's a heavy load. I had a teacher come to my office one day and said, you know, Principal L, that crown is very heavy that you wear. I would never want to wear that crown but I respect you for even making the attempt because there's so many people who get to the door and walk away and never make that attempt to be a school leader. And that really made a difference for me because sometimes I feel underappreciated, you know, um, unappreciated. But I, um, I do realize that as a man in this world that I must make sure that I'm a great role model for uh, not only young people but for men to understand that, to teach them that we ought to make sure we're respecting all people, because we, we should be, we should be the leaders in our community. We have our last question from Beverly. Beverly, you now have the mic. Uh, to ask a question, Beverly, just, uh, just go to click the F2 on the left bottom color. Oh, Tina Shea does too. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, we'll go ahead and give the mic to Tina Shea. Oh, well, no, Beverly just came on. Okay, sorry, Beverly. Well, we'll go uh, with um, with Tina Shea. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I've been moderating sessions all day, and now I'm a nervous wreck. Uh, basically, I just wanted to add to what everyone else was saying, that I was just so inspired. As a teacher at my school, I'm looked upon as the tech guru, and I try to share tools with people, and it's always an uphill battle, and I get discouraged. But today, I'm encouraged. I'm ready to go back to my school and fight the good fight and try to get more people on board. So I just want to thank you for giving me that inspiration, because things I'm in New Orleans, too, and things have been very rough lately. So I, I really appreciate appreciate that inspiration because it's not really um, that available these days for us teachers. So thanks again. Yes, and you know as educators we are afraid to embrace technology because, see, technology places us in that learning zone. And so to go into that learning zone, we must come out of the comfort zone. And that learning zone is close to the frustration zone. And so you have not only building leaders but district leaders who are afraid to embrace technology. And technology opens so many doors for not only our children but our educators. I even had one of our, you know, superintendents say to me, well, technology, you know, doesn't teach a kid to read, but they don't understand that what it does is it gives the students the opportunity to do so much more. They can read in 10,000 ways. But we, have, we need people like you, champions for technology, who are willing to fight that fight and continue. So don't lose hope. Don't be discouraged. I'll be coming to New Orleans soon, and I'm coming to see you because I'm going to check on you and make sure that you have not given up, and I'm also going to make sure that those administrators are supporting you because if they're not, then they're going to have to see me because my philosophy is that there's no class that won't pass. And so you have to have that support, you know, to make that happen. And so please stay in touch with me, stay strong, stay in the fight, because we cannot do it without you. And, and, and just show them all the wonderful educators that are on Twitter. That will let them know why we need to make sure that our students have iPads in their hand. And I, I, just, I just bought three 300 iPods, you know, for my, you know, for my school. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to do big things, and this technology is going to help us because this is a way for our students to develop this global identity, and that's what we have to do. So stay in the fight.